Can you hear me? Okay. Start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you for the privilege to come to you. We thank you that you want to make yourselves known to us. And not just known, but known intimately. As a parent to a child, as a bride to a groom. You desire to have intimacy and fellowship with us so that we can love you with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, all of our strength, and so that we can love others as Christ loved. Father, as we study your word today, help us to think about how Christ loves and how the Spirit does live inside of us and how we can live a different life by the power of the Spirit. We can't save ourselves, and you did that for us. We can't transform ourselves, and you will do that for us. And you will spend all of eternity with, we will spend all eternity with you because of who you are and the love you have for us. So help us to focus on that as we study your word and apply it to our lives that we may live like Christ until we meet him face to face. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this week, you should have read Exodus chapters 9 through 24. First Thessalonians, and then you should have started Second Thessalonians, but I'm not going to get into Second Thessalonians yet because I figured it would be a good breaking point just to end with the first letter. And I've entitled this, Let My People Go. Did you read Scripture? Why don't you read Scripture first? I forgot. I'm all messed up today. Would you like to read Scripture? Come on up here. <laughs> just dawned on me. Yeah, well, I don't know about that. All right, Merle. All right. Good morning. All right, so here we go. Scripture reading God's Word today is 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 9. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature but not the wisdom of this age, or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom a mystery that has been hidden, and that God testifies of <clears throat> for our glory before time began. None of the rulers, rules of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived. This thing God has prepared for those who love him. So be it. Good job. Am I back on? Can you hear me? Okay. So if we're going to start this journey through 1 Thessalonians, I want to take you back to Acts chapter 17 first. Paul and Silas go to Thessalonica on their second missionary journey. They're spreading the gospel all over the world and there is persecution and suffering because we fight a spiritual battle and Satan's doing his best to stop this. To stop this spreading the gospel, the good news to the ends of the earth as Jesus said that they would do. And a church is born in Thessalonica but they run out of there pretty fast. They get to spend three or four weeks there preaching uh, the gospel message. And now the time has come later where Paul wants to write a letter back because the church has been introduced to some false doctrines. They're suffering. But in, like I said, three or four weeks of time spent there, there are people that believe God's message and they live a different life than the, than the people do in the world. In Acts chapter 17, verse 6, but when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials, shouting, These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. And Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are defying Caesar's decree, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. After that, like I said, Paul and Silas are run out pretty quickly, but a family is born. The children of God are born there in that town and they communicate with other children of God and they go through the same sufferings and they are tied together with Konania fellowship. They have fellowship with God, they have fellowship with one another. And I'm thinking back of Israel as we read through Exodus and I'll apply that in a little bit. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, we remember before our God and Father your work produced by your faith, your labor prompted by your love, and, in, and your endurance inspired by hope. 
Maybe you saw that. There's faith, love, and hope there. Faith produced a work in them. They didn't sit idly by. They didn't take this information and say, oh, I'm saved. I've got the knowledge now. They worked. Because of love, they labored, whatever that means. That means that they became the hands and feet of Jesus Christ, that they loved one another. They sold property that was theirs and gave to those that didn't have, whatever the different things were that they did. And then their endurance, which was inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, that they could do these things even while they're facing suffering, while they're facing persecution, and while they're facing false doctrine. One of the false doctrines that had been introduced into the church was that people that had already died and Jesus hadn't returned, they're dead and gone. They, you're never going to see them again. That was one of the false doctrines as you read on in the, in the letter that, that they had to face. So Paul addresses that and tells them that the Lord surely will come and the dead will rise in Christ first. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8, The Lord's message rang out from you. They were living such a life that the message of God, the good news of Jesus Christ, was ringing out from them, not only in the Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has become known everywhere. Now I have to sit back and think, is that what my life is doing? Is that what my church is doing? Are they seeing our good works? Are they seeing our love? Are they seeing our fellowship? And are we speaking out to Bonner's Ferry, to Sandpoint, and then beyond to the rest of the, our area and into the world? It's what we're supposed to be doing. That's how a church is supposed to live. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it. Verse 9, For they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols. There's your faith. To serve the living and true God. Love in action. And to wait for His Son from heaven. To hope and endure. To grow and mature. And to run this race stripping off everything that we can because we know what the prize is there for us and we know the king that we're serving. Is that how we live as a Christian? <clears throat> Verse 10, And to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, Jesus who rescues us from coming wrath. Okay, now I've got to go back and think of Exodus and how God rescued. He heard the prayers of His children and He rescued them, but yet... Soon thereafter, they grumbled and complained. How many times do I do that? 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, worthy of the calling that you have, worthy of the salvation that you have, worthy of the God who created you and redeemed you by the precious blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. This church, it was costing them to follow Jesus, but they knew that it was worth it. Verse 13, And we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. As we read and study God's Word, Scripture tells us that it will not come back void. Even though the grass withers and the flower fade, the Word of God endures forever, and it changes you as you study and read it and let it nourish your very soul. <clears throat> Paul wanted to visit them, but he couldn't, so he sends Timothy later. He says, For what is our hope, what is our joy, what is our crown? Those that have discipled and birthed this church their hope, their joy, and their crown when they come in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, is it not you? Those who have followed after, those who have chosen to believe, you may see it in your lifetime, you may not see it in your lifetime, but you're supposed to plant those seeds, you're supposed to live a life of worth, you're supposed to let them see your light so that they know that your faith is genuine. Verse 20, Indeed you are our glory and our joy. So I have to stop then again and think, who am I serving? Okay, if I am serving God, am I laboring? Am I working hard at it? Am I making it my focus? Or are there other things entangling me and dragging me down? Yes, we've got to work to feed our family and so forth, but do we work for idols instead so many times? Who am I really, truly laboring for? 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 8. 
When he could not visit, he sent Timothy to check on, the, on them, and they get, Timothy gives them a good report. For now we really live, now we really live, since you are standing firm in the Lord. Because they found out about that, it gave them hope to go on to endure. Because they saw that the seeds that they had planted were doing something. That people were responding, that they were making a difference. And like I said, sometimes you see that, sometimes you don't. But it is nice when you see it. And don't forget then to reach out and to disciple them and train them up further. And guess what? As you're training them, they're training you in righteousness just the same. Verse 8, for we, we really live since you are standing firm in the Lord. I'm going to skip down to verse 12. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and everyone else, just as ours does for you. May He strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus Christ comes with His holy ones. Faith, love, and hope to the end. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1, We instructed you how to live. How to live what for? In order to please God, as in fact you are living. So I had to stop there again and do some self-examination and seeing if I am living right, if the way I am living is pleasing God, and if I am doing that more and more with my life. Now we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus Christ to do this more and more. And as I think back to Israel, I saw them doing it less and less. I don't even know what to say. <laughs> Verse 8, Therefore anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being but God, the very God who gives you His Holy Spirit. The world teaches this, God teaches this, and unless you come out of the world and don't longingly look back at it, you will continue to serve those idols and be drawn to them instead of drawn to God. Look at Israel's example again. Verse 16, For the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump, trump call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that we are, who are still alive and left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so will we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore encourage one another with these words. Don't take these words and make false doctrines, anything else. Encourage people that... Although you face struggles in this world, although you've lost loved ones that you want to spend time with, you live for the hope in Jesus Christ that we will all be reunited with Him and we will spend eternity with Him and He will wipe away every tear. There will be no more pain, no more suffering. There will be an eternity with God your Creator, you in the relationship that He intended for you to be in. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3, Why people, the world, is saying peace and safety... While they're saying everything is good, you've got all the technology, all the things you have, you, uh, you know, you're, you're taken care of, you're comforted, then destruction will come on them suddenly. As labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness so that this day should not surprise you like a thief. You are children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then... Let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. Let us not be dead in our trespasses and sin, but let us be alive and living for Jesus until He returns. So how am I living? How are you living? How is the church living? Are we living like Jesus in this world? But since we belong to the day, verse 8, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. You see it again? Faith, love, and hope. Verse 9, For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us that whether we are awake or asleep, we may, we may live together with Him. Therefore, because He said all these things, encourage one another and build each other up. Just in fact, you're doing. This church is a good example, and he only spent three to four weeks with them telling them about the gospel message. That means after he planted the seeds and gave them some basic instructions, they must have studied what scriptures they had. They must have spent time together. They must have, must have focused on God. They must have prayed, and they must have left the things of this world behind so that they could focus on kingdom living because they are doing it. So how many times do you encourage one another? 
Well, let alone encourage one another. How many times do you build each other up? Verse 16. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Rejoice sometimes. No, rejoice always. Pray every once in a while. Pray a good bit. No, pray continually. And give thanks in all circumstances. That one hit me. Uh, in all circumstances? Well, yes, because of the hope that we have in Christ Jesus and we know that He is working all things together for good for those that love Him and we know that not even a hair on our head will be harmed without Him knowing it. So why aren't we working for Him wholeheartedly, fixing our eyes on Jesus rather than longingly looking back at the world? <clears throat> Do not quench the Spirit. Verse 19. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all, hold on to what is good, reject every kind of evil. May God Himself, the God of peace, sanctify and make you holy through and through, and He will. He is faithful and just to do so. May your whole spirit, soul, and body, all of my being, be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now we read Exodus chapters 9 through whatever they were, 23, is that right? 24, at the same time we were reading those chapters. And the plagues continue. Hmm. Am I thankful, giving thanks in all circumstances? Am I praying continually? Am I seeing God working in my life? Did they see that? That they, God was answering their prayers? But they had to suffer some of the plagues along with the Egyptians. They didn't have to suffer some of the plagues. And notice that as the plagues continue, Pharaoh's heart continues to harden. I said Pharaoh's heart continues to harden. Pharaoh did it to himself before God ever hardened his heart if you look at scripture God said to him let my people go so that they may worship me but he wasn't willing to let them go because he wanted the people's worship and honor for himself because he thought he was a God so he hardened his heart each time that came and you got to think about what all that worship means. And as we read Thessalonians, maybe you think about that, but it is how we reverently bow down and submit to God, to His authority, that we are obedient to what He tells us to do, that we obey His commands, that we give sacrifices to Him which cost something, that we give our bodies as a living sacrifice. And He was going to get the people out of the bondage of slavery and the pagan God so that they could truly worship Him and see His provisions and see His goodness. So plague number one was water to blood, right? Death occurs without water. How was Israel affected? Scripture doesn't tell us. You can put in whatever you want to. And it was a direct standoff to the gods of the pagan culture of Egypt. Isis was the god of the Nile that brought prosperity to the land, that brought life. And the sorcerers copied that same miracle. And Pharaoh hardens his own heart. Plague two was frogs. There's a frog goddess too, the goddess of birth and new life. Well, that life overran them to everywhere and that life became the stench of death. So if you really think that the things that you have, your success, your health, your family, whatever, lead to life, they are blessings from God who gives life. Don't ever let them become your idols. They brought the stench of death to the land of Egypt into their homes. How was Israel affected? Scripture doesn't really tell us again. The sorcerers did the same miracles. Pharaoh agrees at this point to let them go, and he, the word that is used there in chapter 8, verse 8, is to sacrifice for it to cost me something. I'm going to go out to worship God, and it's going to cost me something. Pharaoh even asked for prayer. But Scripture tells us again that Pharaoh hardens his own heart. Then we have the plague of the gnats. Gnats like the sand in the desert. So that they topple that Egyptian god just the same. How was Israel affected? Go and look at Scripture. Sorcerers could not duplicate this miracle though. They declared that this was from the finger of God by His power and His might because they could not do the same. 
by whatever forces gave them their power. Pharaoh hardens his heart again. Plague number four is flies, and there is a fly god, and that, that god is toppled as well. This time there is a distinction between Israel and Egypt. Pharaoh tells them to go sacrifice in the land of Egypt. I mean, in the land, but stay in Egypt. Okay, he says, but you can't go far. You can go sacrifice to your God now, but don't go far, because I still want to have hold of you. And he asks for prayer again, and Moses agrees, but warns him of his deceit. And Pharaoh hardens his heart. Okay, that's what we read the week before. Now we're into Exodus chapter 9, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, This is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, says, Let my people go. Good riddance, Egypt and your gods and your king. I serve another king, just like the church in Thessalonica did, and it cost them. Let my people go. Why? So that they may worship me. Serve and labor for me. So I'm thinking back to those verses that talked about how they labored, how they endured, how they lived a different life in this world despite persecution and false doctrine. So plague number five is the death of livestock. Your goods. <laughs> and it, but not in the land of Goshen where Israel, God's children, lived. Pharaoh hardens his heart again. Plague six, boils. Now it's getting a little bit personal, isn't it? <laughs> the gods have been toppled, but there's still one god left to topple. Me, myself, and I. Right? Will Pharaoh still be his own god? There weren't boils in the land of Israel. And if you look back at Scripture there, it's too late for Pharaoh. God hardens Pharaoh's heart. Uh, that, that is some of the scariest scriptures that I ever read. That there is a point where there is no turning back from hearing His Word. He won't call to you anymore. So I have to think, how many times did I hear you calling today, yesterday, the day before, and I ignored your voice? Plague 7, hell comes. There's a warning with this. The death is coming. You better seek shelter. God raised up Pharaoh for the purpose of displaying his might and his glory. It's too late for Pharaoh, but it's still time for others. Will you see it? Verse 20 of chapter 9, those officials of Pharaoh who feared the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord, hurried to bring their slaves and their livestock inside. But those who ignored the word of the Lord left their slaves and livestock in the field. The hail and death came with thunder and lightning. And I say that because we see God's power and thunder and lightning when we approach the mountain of God as we keep reading. It was too late for Judas. It was too late for Pharaoh when they reached a certain point because they hardened their heart against God so much that He hardened it for them. Plagues 8, 9, and 10 come, locusts, darkness, and the death of the firstborn. Scripture tells us constantly that we're supposed to be the firstborn in Jesus that we're supposed to be new fruits, that we're supposed to be new creations in Christ. There is eternal death coming, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And it's not the blood of goats and bulls that will save you. It is the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. And if He has saved you from this, how would you still longingly be looking back at the gods of this world? Why would you still be relying on them, and especially on your own self as your own God? You will be okay if you fear and worship God, if you obey all of His commandments. We get the commandments set up for the festivals of Passover and unleavened bread, but we can't follow His commandments. I try to be good. Paul says that he tries to be good, but he constantly fights with his, with his flesh. I could give you numerous examples where I try but fail. But praise be to Jesus Christ who did not, that went silent before His accusers, even though He was being unjustly murdered and he did it for you and I and they yelled insults at him and said if you are God come off the cross but he knew why he needed to stay on the cross because it was our salvation he was laying down his life as an atonement for our sins so mark these festivals on your calendar so that you can teach them to your children back to the scripture that Barry read from last week 
Get rid of all yeast. Not some yeast, not most yeast, all yeast. Because if you don't get rid of all yeast, what will happen? It will come back and permeate the whole loaf. Jesus said in Matthew 16, Be careful. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees. They discussed them, this among themselves as the disciples and said, It must be because we, don't, we didn't bring any bread with us. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked, You of little faith, why are you talking among yourselves about having no bread? Verse 9 of Matthew 16, Do you still not understand? Nope. Increase my faith, Lord. Increase my comprehension. As I read and study your word, show me your truth. Shepherd me so that I can shepherd those. Oh, show me how to be a priest so that I can be a priest for my family, for my friends. Offering spiritual sacrifices pleasing to you. Because I am bringing God to them if I live that way. Verse 12, then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teachings of the Pharisees and Sadducees. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Jesus said, What about you? Who do you say that I am? Who is Jesus to you? Is he your Savior? Is he your Lord? Your Lord that you obey regardless of circumstances that you give thanks and praise for, that you trust and obey Him no matter what. Exodus chapter 13 talks about consecrating your firstborn, sanctifying them, making them holy. If you believe that God will rescue you, if you believe that He is your hope, you sacrifice the best that you have and you buy back your firstborn child which is exactly what Jesus Christ has done for you. And He tells you to teach your children when you go to bed, when you get up, when you're going around, when you sit down to eat, everything else, and to obey all of His commandments. And if you do this, this leads to life. And He remembers His blessing from generations to generations to generations. God's children leave. They exodus Egypt. They're foreign gods and the men who worship and serve and offer sacrifices to other gods. They leave that place. They leave it all behind and become foreigners in this land. This is something worth singing about, Exodus chapter 15. You break out in song. You see the mighty works of God. But Exodus 16, they longingly look back and worry about what they're going to eat and not only worry about it, but complain and grumble about it. Jesus said in Luke 9, 62, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of heaven. God will feed you. That's why when Jesus taught you how to pray, He said to pray for daily bread. Oh, and share it, or what bread you have might get full of maggots. I'm directly taking this back to Exodus. Exodus 17, God will give you living water. He will fight for you. John chapter 4 the woman asked Jesus because she wants to know if He is who she thinks He might be. Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well to drink from himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to Him, Sir, give me this water. Exodus chapter 18, there are quarreling and disputes time after time after time among God's children. There are no other foreigners in the land now. They're foreigners in the land, but this is the family of God, God's children. But they're quarreling amongst each other. So much that Moses has to appoint people to handle the quarreling. Exodus 19 and 20, they're coming to the mountain of God to receive His laws. God is going to make a covenant promise with them that if they obey, they will live, live, live. And not just live, but they will eat out of gardens they did not plant. God will take care of them, nourish them, take care of their children if they will obey. 
Whew, thank goodness for Jesus because I cannot obey either. Thank goodness for the mercy and grace that God has given me. And He'll change me. He'll sanctify me as I, long as I don't conform to this world, as long as I read and study, as long as I pray to Him. And I need you and I together doing this together because it sure helps to hear a, con a considerate word and it sure helps to hear things that build you up and edify you. So then we get Exodus chapter 21 to 24 and these laws start getting kind of, hmm, <laughs> if your donkey does this and you and that, that and, but it's expounding upon God's law because He's creating not only a nation but a family for the world to see how we live differently than the world so that they see who we are so they believe the God that we serve because we live different lives than what we did before. God told Pharaoh, let my people go. Why? So that they could worship Him. Bend down and serve Him. Pay respect and homage to Him. Submit to Him and His laws. Be good stewards. Sing praises. Give sacrifice. Give thanksgiving. Fight injustice. Give generos gener generously. To live wholly set apart lives. Not to grumble and complain and have no faith and make false promises because you let it go in one ear and out the other. If only people would obey, but praise be to God who graciously gives us His Son, Jesus Christ. This changes everything. It changes the way that I think, the way that I live. And I know I can't do it on my own, so I have to submit to God who lives and dwells inside of me so that I can be a royal priest in a family of royal priests, as Peter tells me. Hebrews 12, chapter, chapter 12, verse 18. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched, and it is burning with fire to darkness, gloom, and a storm, to a trumpet blast or to such voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses even said, I am trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. Not just God's children singing, but angels singing. To the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven, you have come to God, the judge of all, to, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, mature and complete. To Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At the time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is created things. But I, my faith, because of my faith, because of what a Jesus Christ is, I will have a firm foundation that is unshakable. <laughs> have you heard the good news? Let me tell you what Jesus has done for me. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. And so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. And that takes me where I've got to take you to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, because of all Paul is presented to the Romans and the Roman gods in that day, the same story again. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Or depending on your translation, it says service. What you do as a result. If you worship God, then you serve Him. If you worship God, you spread the gospel message. If you worship God, you give up the idols of this world. If you worship God, you live for Him instead of the things you lived for before. 
and you're even satisfied with daily bread. You don't complain about it. What you said when it first came out, what is this? It's, it's bread from heaven. Boy, when we get off the path, how quickly we, that grumbling and plain, complaining takes us so far away from Jesus. I am your God. You are my people. God said that to Israel. But I've got to ask, if I am God's people, I put me instead of Israel in, then how am I really worshiping? Because there are so many things that distract me from doing that. I also have to learn from Scripture that God was testing His children. That word can be called tempt, but when God is doing it, it is trying, testing, and approving. Proving you, because God already knows. Did you know the word can also be translated as NASA? It can be translated as adventure. Did you know that one? <laughs> We're on this adventure. Of being God's people here in a fallen world. To shed light so that people can have salvation and live in a world that is all new, including heavens and earth, because of their unshakable faith in Jesus Christ. Genesis, the word is used here in, in Scripture prior to Exodus. Genesis 22, verse 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham, and you know what happened there. In Exodus 15, then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it in the water, and the water was, became fit to drink. Then the Lord issued a ruling instruction for them and put them to the test. That's the second time it's used in Scripture, and you read that this week. He said in verse 26, If you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in His eyes, if you pay attention to His command and keep all of His decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Exodus chapter 16, the word is used again in verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way I will test them to see if they follow my instructions or not. Exodus 17 verse 2, the word is used in contrast. So they quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses replied, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to your test? So when I'm not satisfied and I'm not thanking God all the time and when I'm grumbling and complaining, I'm putting God to the test instead of me. But I know He's faithful and true. I, I know it because I know the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> that means everything to me again. It changes who I am from the inside out and it has to change the way that I live. Exodus 17 verse 7, And he called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled because they tested the Lord saying, Is the Lord among us or not? How many times have I cried that when things have not gone the way that I wanted them to go? Why me? In Exodus 20, 20, Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. Is your life becoming more and more like Christ? Are you sinning less and less? What do you need to evaluate? What idols do you need to get away of? What things do you need to strip so that you can run this race with perseverance? Oh, and yes, we need somebody to run it with so when we fall they can lift us up and not only lift us up, but encourage us to run on even stronger because the end is coming. That's the church. That's the Christian family that God has birthed. That's the Gentiles that are grafted into the true Israel, those that have the faith of Abraham who was tested and found to fear and love the Lord more than his own son. So Peter says, well, Exodus 19, you read this, verse 6, You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 8-10, through 10, they stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for, Pharaoh and Judas. But you, no, not you, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may what? Declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. 
So are we complaining when we've been called out? Are we longingly looking back? Are we thanking God for daily bread and thanking Him for everything else, even the persecutions and sufferings that come in this world, because he knows, we know that He's testing our faith to prove it to ourselves, not to Him, and that by being obedient, others are seeing the way we live, what we believe, and they're, at least the seeds are getting planted about who God is and who Jesus Christ is. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So I wrote down there that it's time for me to evaluate again how I'm living for Christ. Jesus said these words when he profoundly silenced the people on a mount. He said, you've heard that it was said to people long ago, you shall not murder. Anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. Well, I know that. I'm not that bad person. But I tell you, Alan, that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Scripture tells us every thought, every idle word, oh yeah, my words better be comforting and edifying you heard it also said that you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you, Alan, that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in her heart. Let me expound upon that to you, Alan. If your right eye causes you to stumble, then it's better to gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. So why am I complaining about certain things in my life that I find uncomfortable? You've also heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Yeah, I can go with that one. <laughs> but I tell you, Alan, love your enemies and pray for those. Pray for those who persecute you. Why? That you may be children of your Father in heaven. Matthew 5, verse 45. So as I was preparing for this and thinking, I thought about how Pharaoh hardened his heart. I thought about how hard Pharaoh's heart was that he saw these things. And even his own sorcerer said, this is from the finger of God. Because they feared God. Whether they turned to Him or not, they at least saw it. And then it came a point because Pharaoh hardened his heart that he didn't even see anymore. It was only darkness. And then I asked my question, myself a question. Was most of Israel's heart just as hard? What about the church? What about me? Pharaoh recognized God but failed to worship and serve Him, but God still used Him for His glory. If you remember back... He set out and eat it because he was God in the land to kill all the firstborn children. But Moses escaped that, didn't he? Because God had a plan for him. And God has a plan for you. And ultimately, because Pharaoh made that edict, his firstborn was killed. Whew. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to condemn the world and be a preacher of righteousness, righteousness like Noah. I don't care how many years it takes to build an ark. I'm going to build an ark on Jesus Christ to save my firstborn. Are you? Who can you be a witness to today? Who can you be a light to today? What do you need to get rid of to keep you from doing that? Oh, and the grumbling and complaining is the biggest reason that an angel of death was sent into the camp of, of Israel. Because they grumbled and complained. So what does my life look like, especially my worship and service to God? Is it pleasing and acceptable? Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you that you are a God worthy of all praise, glory, and honor. That you are so great and mighty, faithful and true, loving and kind and merciful and evenly just. And that you did for us what we can never do you sent your son to be just like us in every form that gave up heaven 
and did not consider equality with you something to use for his gain, but instead laid down his life as a human being in a perfect sacrifice so that we could have hope that we could have salvation and faith through Jesus Christ so that you could dwell with us, so that you would empower us with your spirit to be a light to this world, to continue the work that Jesus Christ started in spreading this gospel message to the ends of the earth. We thank you and praise you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.